I'm Tim Ventura from American Anti-Gravity, and today we're joined by Dr. John Brandenburg, a theoretical plasma physicist working on particle astrophysics and a fundamental quantum theory of gravity, along with the GEM Unified Field Theory. He joins us to discuss how the Murad Brandenburg Pointing Field Conservation Equation may offer insights into recent experiments in gravity modification involving rotating magnetic fields. Well, John, thanks for joining us, and I'd like to start out by asking about your recent role in a gravity modification experiment conducted by Paul Murad and Morningstar Applied Physics. How did you get involved, and what can you tell me about it? Well, Paul and I have been working for a long time together. He was very encouraging. Uh, when I was down at Kennedy Space Center working at the Florida Space Institute, he contacted me. We started working together. He basically encouraged me to start going to conferences and presenting my work uh, very aggressively, which I did. And uh, one of the things that came out of the uh, GEM theory, which stands, it's basically, the goal initially was just to unify gravity and E&M, the two, hence the name GEM the two long-range forces of nature, but it also stands for what we call grandis et medianus, a Latin phrase that means the unity of the great, meaning the cosmic scale and the Planck scale, high energy scale of, of physics, with the middle, the mesoscale, which is where atomic things occur, and in fact, sort of like where we live, uh, the physics of everyday life. So the great, the cosmic, and the Planck scale are united with where we live in the middle scale. Uh, but anyway, he uh, encouraged me in my research, and <clears throat> I had discovered in the GEM theory what I call the vacuum Bernoulli equation, which is analogous to the aerodynamic Bernoulli equation for um, flight. And basically, we found, I found in the theory, which is based on the combination of Kaluza-Klein hidden dimension theory plus Sakharov's radiation pressure theory of gravity, that the pointing vector assumed great importance. The pointing vector is what carries momentum and energy in the electromagnetic field. When a light wave crosses uh, and strikes a solar cell and creates electricity, the thing that is carrying the energy of that light wave is the pointing vector. If you launch a solar sail in space, the sunlight striking it is creating a pressure. It's carrying momentum. To the, uh, so that the solar sail can sail out to Mars with no rocket fuel, propellantless propulsion. The thing that is carrying the force of the sunlight is the pointing vector. Now, in my theory, which unifies gravity and electromagnetism, the pointing vector assumes the role of also doing the work of gravity, say, difference in pointing vectors. It's more like not just the pointing vector itself, but its curvature that's important. And what we found in the uh, GEM theory, it, whose development was encouraged by Paul Murad and also Morgan Borderman, was that if we created a vortex of pointing vectors, then local gravity would be affected by the theory. And how much the gravity would be affected was kind of a center of argument. There were some undetermined constants but we felt we had an equation that would basically allow us to do local modification of gravity based on a kind of tornado or vortex of pointing vectors. Now, you must understand, the pointing vortex is actually around us all the time. Every induction motor that was invented by Nikolai Tesla, Tesla was the real inventor of the pointing vortex. He basically found the rotation of the electromagnetic field creates a vortex of pointing vectors. If you put a piece of metal in this, the metal wants to rotate with the vortex. And this is the principle of the induction motor that's found every place. Induction motors are nice and simple. They require almost no maintenance because everything is done by fields, not by electrical commutators carrying current across rotating contacts. It's a block of metal that's specially designed and it spins in the pointing vortex created by the coils, which operate normally on three-phase power. Sure. So this sure. is the invention of Tesla. And what we found in the theory was that if you create a Tesla pointing vortex, that it will locally modify gravity. Just like the high-speed movement of wind in a tornado, a aerodynamic vortex creates a low-pressure zone in the air, 
and that's why houses explode when a tornado passes over them. These things are created by aerodynamic vortices. In the gem theory, a pointing vortex creates a lower area of gravity, and ultimately you can use this for flight. And uh, by the way, this was all described in a book called Beyond Einstein's Unified Field that I wrote, Gravity and Electromagnetism Redefined, uh, published by Adventures Unlimited. And you can find that on Amazon.com. Now, let me back up for just a sec, because you've mm-hmm. covered a lot of ground here. So I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. I love talking about this stuff. Oh, yeah. And this is wonderful material. You've just gone over so much. I want to try and touch on some of the pieces. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now the pointing vector is how photon fields propagate in quantum electrodynamics. So you're That's right. You're proposing that by creating a vortex of pointing vectors that you can generate this propulsive effect. And that's presumably how Paul Murad and the Morningstar device was able to lose mass. Now, I want you to know that this came about as a result of looking at data in the you know, in the scientific literature there was uh, a Russian scientist named Kazarev, who created a pointing vortex. He was actually just using aviation gyroscope, and he found that the this is working in Russia in 1968. He reported that when he spun a gyroscope in the counterclockwise direction, using three-phase pointing vortex, like a Tesla vortex, that the spinning rotor in the aviation gyroscope, which is made of metal would actually lose a small amount of weight. It would lose about a a part per thousand of weight. And that's a small amount, but it's very easy to detect with sensitive balances. In Kozarev's case, he was working with torsion, right? He, uh, He had a kind of vague theory of how this was all working. It was based on, he thought it was more vibration than the vortex pattern. But in any case, he reported these results in this uh, report. And, you know, he was considered a very important scientist in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So uh, this was immediately translated by the U.S. government and published, and that's how I became aware of it. But what happened also was two Japanese scientists, I believe Hayasaka and Yamaguchi, anyway, they published in 1989 a very similar experiment where they found the same effect, Exactly. In fact, what was interesting is you rotate it in the counterclockwise direction, the effect occurs, but if you rotate it in the clockwise direction, the effect disappears. So there's some other subtleties involved. Uh, Quantum mechanics is full of effects like this, uh, what is called spinner relationships. So anyway, uh, some people also did um, experiments with compressed air, spinning up rotors, and they found no effect which indicated that it was the electromagnetic field that had to be the key effect. So basically, this is very exciting. Now, as it turns out, the new magnets they have invented, the neodymium iron magnets, I call it improved iron. Iron has always been the basis of magnetism. But if you mix this rare earth neodymium with it, it makes a very powerful magnet. They're so powerful, in fact, they're kind of dangerous because they snap on your fingers and they'll like, uh, they won't let go. Yeah, <laughs> and I understand that that's what Paul used in the construction of his device. That's right. Now, what happens when you create an array of just magnets, and Paul reversed the magnets uh, so that one magnet would be facing north, you know, north would be up, and the next magnet would be north facing down. And based on his kind of intuition as an engineer and also my gem theory that we were trying to create a pointing vortex, it turns out when you create an array of magnets like that where they're up, down, up, down, up, down, and you rotate that, that automatically creates a pointing vortex. And you can do that then without very powerful, having to carry a lot of electricity around the room. So it means a fairly low-power experiment can create a very tremendous pointing vortex effect where otherwise you'd have to use a megawatt of power. And so this was considered to be an inexpensive way to achieve a very powerful pointing vortex effect. And uh, then you spin that up, of course, with a motor. And Paul and Morgan Boardman wanted to explore what this would actually do, what the phenomenology would be when you did this, And lo and behold, we found that, at least according to the 
electronic load cells supporting the whole device that it lost a few percent of weight when the thing was spun up. Mm, okay. And so it was the experiment could be said to have a positive result. Um, don't pack your bags for Mars yet. We're a long way from a spaceship, but uh, at least we seem to have found this effect with the pointing vortex with something that's fairly easy to build, uh, you know, just using a big, uh, big motor. So the spinning of the magnets, moving the magnetic fields through space in a circular pattern creates automatically, uh, you can show from Maxwell's equations, this creates automatically the pointing vector. By the way, pointing vector, it's almost a pun uh, because the fellow who invented it was named Pointing, spelled with a Y. Uh, he was an English physicist who worked under Maxwell. Mm, okay. so he invented this in the late 1800s. It, it actually does point, however, in the direction of the energy and momentum flow in the electromagnetic field. <laughs> it's a pointing vector. Actually, it sounds like it's pointing, and it actually, but it's named after a guy named Pointing. Yeah. Well, you know, l let me touch on the mechanical rotation aspect of this because, yes. you know, in the, you might call it popular mythology or the, you know, the engineer's stories that float around, this mechanical yeah. rotation, it plays an enormous role in these devices. And yes. in Murad's device, which was based loosely on Godin and Roshan, as well as the Searle generator, obviously that's where the rotation comes from. But oh, Well, that's right. They had heard reports of course, that people had seen these effects. You know, of course, Searle and Godin and Roshan. Uh, Searle is uh, uh, an interesting, colorful character in Britain, and Godin and Roshan are a pair of Russians. And as if you've watched the news lately, you got to realize the Russians aren't communists anymore, but they're still Russians, and they are very wily. Well, what's... They are tip by the way, they typically... Russian scientists typically vet everything that they publish through the Russian Federal Security Service. Uh, it used to be called the KGB. Mm, okay. So I, I, and I, in fact, I told I, Paul and I would sit around, Paul and Morgan Bordman and I would sit around and discuss this and say, well, if the Russians have discovered anti-gravity, the last thing they're going to do is tell us, uh, tell us uh, uh, Americans how to do it. So they'll probably leave stuff out of their reports, et cetera. In other words, you can't trust completely the details of what they're saying. And we found uh, that they were observing the same effect, apparently, as the Hayasaka and uh, Kazarev experiments, only creating with rotating magnets. Um, Got to remember, it's one thing to have the Bernoulli equation written on a chalkboard, and it's another thing to build an airplane that flies. Yeah. So and so you there's a lot of details and engineering art that goes into building an airplane that isn't in the Bernoulli equation. We have a vacuum pointing Bernoulli equation and we have an effect, but we're a long way from being able to make anything that would propel itself. Now, in terms of the rotation, though, to get back to that for a second, yes. many years ago, I had the privilege of speaking with Tom Bearden, and this came up in the same context, and he said, yes. he said, you have to keep in mind that electrons traveling in a wire typically only travel about one foot through the wire per hour, I believe it was. It's very, very slowly. That's right. It flows just like water in a hose. Yeah, and in contrast, if you take those same electrons, right, as a charging balance, you put a capacitance on a rotor or something like that, right. and, and you rotate them through space, they're still translating through the background time space. They're, you know, translating through the ether, if you will, but they're yeah. moving at thousands of miles per hour. Now, that difference in speed in in electrical engineering, it doesn't really take that into account most of the time. But do you think no, that... No, it, 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 all it looks at is the aggregate charge. Exactly. And its aggregate motion. But on a particle basis, do you think that that actual rotation speed might play a role in the pointing vector? <laughs> oh, I believe so. Uh, I believe the details of these things are very important. Uh, how you rotate it... Um, what is the configuration of the magnets? Um, whether you put charge on it. If you charge the rotor, especially if the distribution of charge around the rotor is not uniform, you know, there's maybe areas of changing voltage uh, around the rotor, then this also adds to the pointing 
effect. Because oh, okay. if you move an electric field, this also creates pointing vector. Anytime you take a electromagnetic field, either electric or magnetic or a combination of the two and move it, pointing vector instantly is created. So charging the rotor may actually be an important effect, but we're kind of feeling our way along here. We have a rough map to get through the dark forest, but we're actually trying to find a real path through the forest, and it's, it's different. You have, you have a, a road map, and then you have to find a real path by trial and error. It, yeah, you know, and the thing that I'm excited about, though, is to, to look at this research and where it's come, even in the last few years, you know, that, I, that I've oh, been yes. able to do interviews. Uh, it's remarkable. Right. We have basically a map across the forest. What lies beyond the forest is the magic kingdom of controlled gravity flight, and we are stuck here just with rockets and airplanes on this side of the forest. And the map, unfortunately, is written on the back of a cocktail napkin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you about the paper that you wrote. It, it was called The Murad Brandenburg Pointing Field Conservation Equation and the Possible Gravity Law. And I, I'd like to put that up on the website. I'll, I'll put that up sure. as a download link. Paul, uh, Paul was the main author of that. I was basically a contributor. Um, at Paul's instigation, I actually derived... It was it was a collaborative project. Paul had the idea, and then he asked me, using my math expertise, uh, dealing with vector equations, to write down a wave equation for the pointing vector itself. Not the electric and magnetic fields, but their combination, the pointing vector. And uh, I was able to do that. And in free space, away from sources, the uh, pointing vector goes as a wave, just like the electromagnetic fields do. Uh, of course, because it tags along with them. It's created by them. So um, he has also looked mathematically, and he's quite good at math himself, into um, what would happen if you had, like, magnetic charge, etc. So he's kind of elaborated on it a little bit. But the connection between the pointing vector and gravity is strong. Well, and that's because of the imbalance, right? Like, maybe an example yep. would be, in an AC circuit, it's not the electrons that are really carrying the energy, it's the oscillation of them. And so the it's pointing... the fields, yes. Yeah, so, the, so... Whenever the electrons move, they create field. And, well, uh, like, for instance, high tension lines, the way they transport electric power in this country, and that's due to Tesla. Uh, Tesla's inventions, by the way, are so commonplace that people don't even realize everything. Tesla revolutionized our life. If you pass high tension lines, look up, you'll find the wires that are held by insulators that are actually carrying the voltage. Those are grouped in patterns of three because they're carrying three-phase power. They're also carrying the power at very high voltage. The electrons moving in those wires are moving very slowly, maybe a mile every hour. However, pointing vector is moving down those wires, and it's carrying all the power, and it's mostly carried in the electric field because they make it at very high voltage. Rather than electron motion, which makes magnetism, they are carrying it in electric field. So it's kind of imbalanced. It's, it's an imbalanced electromagnetic field. It's mostly electric field. Mostly electric. Mm, okay. And that's how they transport power long distances. When it gets to a transformer, they transform it down in voltage to make more magnetic field, basically, so it's a more balanced thing that's delivered to your house at lower voltage. Higher current, lower voltage. Yeah. Current creates magnetism. Voltage creates electric field. And so this, this almost, in, in a sense, this almost seems like it brings us back full circle. And if we're able to understand how the rotating magnetic fields, and in your model that's already explained, mm -hmm. if we're able to really harness that, in a sense, maybe gravity modification or uh, you know that type of propulsion, I guess, could almost be another type of uh, electromagnetic motor. Uh, yes, uh, you can consider that, um, let's say we built a craft, ultimately using this effect, it would be in the shape of a kind of satellite dish, 
and it would be a dome. In fact, I discussed this in my book, The Unified Field, Beyond Einstein's Unified Field, uh, that it would be in the shape of a kind of a dome or a satellite dish, and it would have very powerful rotating electromagnetic field underneath the dome, and it would be basically like a hovercraft, which has high pressure under a skirt. Mm, okay. So only this one, this hovercraft, can hover anywhere at once. It doesn't have to be near the ground. But anyway, you create this very powerful rotating, uh, po- pointing vortex under the dome. Above the dome, there's nothing. The fields are confined by the dome, and they effectively push on it. And that would be what an ultimate electromagnetic, uh, a gem craft would look like. But you've got to remember, airplanes look the way they do because of the way they travel. And look how many different types of aircraft there are. There are helicopters, there are very high-speed jet aircraft. Uh, There also are just regular Piper Cubs. So it's all very, it's, it's very exciting. We've made great progress. But I believe the connection between the pointing vector and gravity, controlled gravity, is now being established experimentally. But we have to now, of course, work out the art of amplifying this effect to actually create practical craft. Of course, there are the rumors, of course, that the Nazis during World War II um, using uh, some of the field theories that were available then, Kaluza-Klein, which unifies gravity and electromagnetism mathematically, they may have actually stumbled upon this effect during the uh, early 30s and attempted to exploit it as part of their Wonder Weapon program. Obviously, it did not win the war for them, but they may have done a lot of experiments, just like Werner von Braun developed big rockets and then came to the United States and continued that. The U.S. government may have acquired some expertise in this from the, um, the Germans at the end of World War II. And, you know, I, I have no idea whether that's really true or not, but there, it's, it's very interesting these reports are made. It's also interesting to me that much of the basic physics for doing this kind of theory was available in the 1930s. Oh, yeah, yeah. To me, that's been tremendously interesting. And Kaluza Klein, by the way, theory was an established fact, and you can derive the gem vacuum Newly equation from Kaluza Klein theory, by the way. That was available in 1929. Yeah, this this stuff comes out of the era of power electronics, right? That's when a lot of the physics was also That's developed. right. Uh, people, of course, are obsessed right now with little microchips. This is power electronics. Yeah, and this. so it, it's a little bit dated, and sometimes I worry because I feel like, in a sense, modern engineering and science seems to have passed it by because we're working on such a small scale now. Oh, isn't that interesting how that works? Well, you know, let let me let me go back here because one of the things that you've you've indicated is that the GEM model also offers a way to explain what gives the Higgs boson mass. And as I understand it, that was recently discovered yes. in collider experiments. I am proud to say that uh, I went from being a big skeptic about the Higgs boson, probably because they kept calling it the God particle, which I, I just, as a physicist, is just made my blood curdle. <laughs> Once I got over that and really started reading up on it, uh, it turns out the, with the encouragement of Paul Murad and Morgan Boardman of Morningstar, uh, whom I was working for, they said, uh, well, John, you, you know, you, we've seen that you've kind of unified gravity and electromagnetism in a practical way. How about the other forces of nature, the short-range nuclear forces that have to do with quantum mechanics? And the gem theory is based on quantum mechanics. It's, uh, but what happened was I um, started looking into how to derive the strong and the weak nuclear forces from the gem theory, and I found out that that was possible. And uh, the theory now, uh, there's an article published in the Meta Journal of uh, Science, uh, Space Science, that shows that the pion mass, which is the carrier of the strong force in the nucleus that holds the nucleus together, mm, okay. it's called the, the charged pion and the charged W boson, their masses can be derived to a part per thousand from the gem theory now. So, And the same theory 
then predicts the Higgs boson and gets it within a few percent. I predicted 128 mass units called GEV, which stands for giga electron volts. Um, a proton is one GEV in mass E equals mc squared. So I predicted 128. The Higgs boson apparently is between 125 and 126, so that's within a few percent. And I published this result at the STAFE 2 conference under the sponsorship of Morningstar Applied Physics in March, and that mass number was not known with any degree of certainty until July. Oh, so I okay. Actually, I actually predicted it before it was known, and I'm very proud of that. And, you know, always I'm grateful to Paul Morad and Morgan Borderman's sponsorship for uh, that research. Uh, they supported me financially to do that research and encouraged it. And we got the Higgs boson four months before it was known, and it falls right out of the theory. And, in fact, the theory can be, the GEM theory can, in a sense, be reformulated around the Higgs boson. Let's imagine when the Big Bang happened. Uh, you've got this impossibly hot fireball. The universe is one big ball of plasma expanding rapidly, and its temperature is unimaginable. And then as it expands and cools, just like any fireball, the Higgs boson appears as the most, it's 128, so it'll be appearing at the very high temperatures, and then it lays the groundwork for the formation of hydrogen, protons and electrons that make up the universe. And from that point on, once the Higgs boson is kind of the foundation has been laid, the Higgs boson basically seeds the universe with the proton and the electron mass. And the way you can derive the, uh, the Higgs boson mass at 128 GeV is you say that the Higgs boson Compton radius is the same as the classical uh, electrostatic radius of the proton. In other words, they're in resonance. You have a geometric resonance. The two sizes are the same. The classical radius of, of the proton and the electron are very important in scattering of electromagnetic waves, which underlies gravity. A gravity, think of gravity as kind of running as a bunch of little nudges by the vacuum, the zero point fluctuation around us. So you're you're describing kind of a push gravity, then like Lassage. Push gravity, yeah, oh, exactly. Push gravity and push gravity was actually originated with uh, Sakharov. Oh, okay. Sakharov knew about push gravity because he was building the Russian hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb runs on pointing vector. The way you make, uh, you have a ball of hydrogen, and this used to be classified, by the way. It's no longer classified. A hydrogen bomb invented by uh, Keller and Ulam uh, uses a big watermelon-shaped cavity made of very heavy metal to trap the radiation. Uh, the radiation is trying to move at the speed of light, but the metal is being massive, can't move very fast, so it's essentially fixed during the action. What happens, you set off, you have an atomic bomb at one end of this watermelon-shaped cavity. At the other focal point, you have a ball of hydrogen isotopes. You set off the atomic bomb. It fills the cavity with electromagnetic radiation, the pointing vector. The pointing vector all converges down on the hydrogen, and acts like gravity. It crushes it and turns it into a star. You oh, created okay. an, a hydrogen bomb actually runs on controlled gravity in a sense, according to the gem theory. You're creating instant millionfold gravity inside that container because gravity in this case is a push. It's the vi pointing vector push. Right now in laser fusion, what they're doing is they're creating a very concentrated laser pulse that is full of pointing vector. And that is, once again, trying to crush little pellets of hydrogen to make uh, fusion. So Sakharov was working with these ideas, and he realized that's gravity, is a push by the pointing vector. And because he was working on highly classified uh, Russian weapons programs, his article about gravity as a push is very terse and very abstract. He doesn't talk about these ideas that I talked about. He instead hides it in the math. <laughs> this is what I mean about the wily Russians. 
he laid out a theory of gravity as a push and did it in a one-page article of very abstract mathematics. Mm, okay, okay. <laughs> and, but the, the, it gets better than that. Once people figured out that this is what he had done, then the idea of push gravity was born. So it was Andrei Sakharov, a very, uh, one of the greatest sciences of this 20th century. He's right up there with Einstein. And he published this, and I've, you know, uh, basically Sakharov's model of gravity is that if you have a dark chamber and you put two bright objects in there, to put two uh, very hot uh, ball, st- steel ball bearings in there, and assume you're up in the wait, uh, wait list, like in the space station. Yeah. So you have this black box with two white hot ball bearings in there. They actually push each other because of pointing vector from each of them. They push each other away from each other. So you have that's because of radiation pressure. Now, if you do the opposite experiment and you put two ball bearings in a box of heavy metal, let's say, you heat the box white hot, the two ball bearings will actually attract each other with a 1 over R squared force. Because because they're partially shielding. They're partially shielding each other. If you stand on one ball bearing and you look around, you see white hot metal everywhere, except in the distance you see a black spot. That is the other ball bearing. And that means because of the black spot, it's a shadow. Yeah. So you're, you're following the shadow of the other ball bearing against this white-hot universe you're in. Now, in Sakharov's theory, you'll love this. The white-hot box that creates all of this pointing vector is the vacuum ZPF. Oh. So Sakharov is really the origin of the zero-point gravity model. Would, with the vacuum ZPF, could you consider that as kind of the sum aggregate of all pointing vector radiation that's given off since the beginning of the, the universe? Uh, or, yes. Or, or is it something else? You could kind else? of consider that the part of the, uh, when the Big Bang occurred, uh, of course, the universe was one blinding ball of light. <laughs> Let there be light. Well, <laughs> there was lots of light <laughs> at the moment of creation. It was nothing. The universe, in fact, consisted of basically light. And uh, so then part of the universe, the vacuum ZPF, is still full of that light. Oh, okay, okay. But, but because, uh, you know, and it's one of the mysteries, because of the... Um, And this is by way explained in the gem theory. If light is powerful enough, it becomes space-time and effectively cancels itself out. It self-censors itself. So it becomes, uh, in fact, this goes back to the very ancient idea of the music of the spheres. Uh, This was an idea promulgated by Pythagoras. He said that the whole universe ran on vibrations. The planets were moving around the the cosmos on vibrations. And he said, this is the music of the spheres, but you can't hear it. Because if you did, it would deafen you. You'd hear nothing else. So everything that, that exists basically is immune to that. Sure, sure. It's a, you know, it's a rather complicated idea, but it was actually from Greek philosophy. In the gem theory, what happens is an electromagnetic field existing in space-time, if it becomes strong enough, it becomes space-time. Now, in quantum and therefore mechanics... It and therefore, it sort of disappears. This, this would also be uh, kind of the equivalent of, of holes in quantum mechanics, right? If, if I yes. understand it. Right. The universe is not only full of um, wells, but holes. Yeah. Same time. Well, now to sort of cancel each other, so the result is we can go about our lives above the vacuum ground state. We exist above the vacuum ground state, and the ground state is just the ground we stand on. You don't see it as electromagnetic turbulence, but at the very deepest existence of the charged particles, the protons, the electrons, the quarks that make up the proton, the neutron, which are all charged, by the way. Uh, by the way, uh, Hal Putoff and Eric Davis, 
who's continuing his work. Hal Putoff basically filled in a lot of the gaps in Sakharov's model of gravity. And he also pointed out that you can have an electromagnetic model of gravity that agrees with the standard model of physics because all of the quarks that make up the proton and the neutron, supposedly the neutral particle, they are charged. They're constantly in a dance in the ZPF. And the curvature, the slight variations, the fact that some that particles shadow each other causes gravity. That's how gravity arises from a combination of charged particles and the ZPF. Mm, okay, okay. So that is, in fact, that is Sakharov and Putoff. Uh, and Hal Putoff uh, pointed out that this worked very well. He did a lot of math work on it, but also he said the quarks are charged. Therefore, they're responding to the ZPF all the time, even if the proton, if he's, you know, their aggregate seems to be sitting still, the quarks are in there dancing around all the time. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the gem theory, grandis at medianus, is moving ahead. We got the Higgs boson. We got the weak and the strong fields. Strong forces are now in the gem theory. So it's gone beyond just the long-range forces of nature. It's now wall-to-wall unification. And I'll be presenting this theory very aggressively at scientific conferences over the, uh, in fact, there'll be one in Texas that I put in an abstract for. And uh, I'm going to be just pushing it very persistently as God gives me the strength, and we'll get this thing done. Now, do you have a website? I don't have one. I'm sorry. Uh, when I was working professionally, I was discouraged from having websites. <laughs> Part of uh, the problem with working with the Department of Defense uh, and Department of Energy, NASA, is they like to keep track of what I'm saying. Sure, sure. And so I tend to uh, try and make sure that everything I say is somehow I have people I talk to about various ideas, and I decided that having a website, you're responsible for everything that appears on the website. Well, John, we're, we're almost out of time for today, but I'd like to thank you again for joining us. And oh, Tim, thank you for, thank you for uh, taking this interview. I, I'm very honored. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to explain this to us.